We are at the top of the hour, so greetings and welcome to Field-Based Rule Placemaking, What Works Fast, Now and on a Shoestring. Thank you for joining us for what we promise to be an interactive webinar where each of you will be able to contribute real-time solutions to the communities that are presenting today. I'm Shantaria Charleston, Director of Technical Assistance and Training here at the Housing Assistance Council, a national nonprofit technical assistance intermediary and community development finance institution focused on the creation of affordable homes and sustainable communities across rural America. Over the last five years, in partnership with the National Endowment for the Arts, HAC has successfully executed the Citizens Institute on Rural Design, or what we affectionately refer to as CIRD, C-I-R-D. And so much of that time has been spent learning and growing our capacities with the assistance of our local partners along the way. Through CERD, we've been able to progressively incorporate design and creative placemaking to not only increase the stock of affordable housing, but to also support the creation of livable and stronger communities. Today's webinar reflects in part the lessons and partnerships we've gained at HAC from our rural design and placemaking work. This webinar, like all road sessions, is a collaborative effort co-designed and hosted by Thrive Rural, an initiative of the Aspen Institute Community Strategies Group in partnership with the University of Wisconsin Population Health Institute, generously supported by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. In addition to the Housing Assistance Council, Rhodes collaborators include the Rural Community Assistance Partnership, Rural LISP, the International Economic De Development Council, as well as the Federal Reserve Board. So on behalf of the Housing Assistance Council, I'd like to extend our deepest appreciation to all of our partners. And though she'll briefly introduce herself, I'm proud to share with you that today's moderator is a deeply respected rural artist, facilitator, and advocate, Jamie Horder. So Jamie, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Shantaria. Hey, everybody, I'm Jamie. It's so nice to be with you all today. I'm glad you're here. I am a facilitator and community engagement artist. I'm based in a rural place and I work in rural places throughout the US. And I'm really excited for the conversations that we're gonna dive into today. It's gonna be really interactive. So thanks for being here. Um, for those who are listening in today, uh, I am a white woman, my pronouns are she, her, I have long, dark brown hair and red glasses. I'm wearing a purple shirt and black cardigan and standing in front of a white wall and a purple wall. And home for me is on a farm outside of the community of Lyons, Nebraska, population of about 800 people. This is on the traditional Omaha homelands and it is about 20 minutes away from the Missouri River to give you a little sense of my place. So I want to share um, also that we have a couple um, others on the call, Stephen Sugg and Manda Laporte, who may be jumping in from time to time. You might see them in conversation, but they're also going to be here helping with the chat and making sure that questions get uplifted and adding to the conversation. And they are with the Housing Assistance Council and the Citizens Institute on Rural Design. So please look for them in the upcoming conversation. So let's jump into our agenda. There's a lot of really cool stuff to go over today. Tyler, if you could share that with you. So like I said, this is going to be really participatory today, and I have an invitation. We'll do a check-in as a group. If you haven't noticed, we have this meeting today in a regular meeting format. So if you do want to see everybody, um, you can switch in the top right hand corner of your screen to, to gallery view, and then you can see the spotlight and as many videos as you'd like. And then we are going to meet some consultants that we have on the call today who are going to help guide some conversations and some real workshopping around community. And then hear from three communities who are doing some amazing projects, and they have some design challenges that they're going to bring up so we can workshop live, but this will also be an opportunity for you to ask some questions and provide your insight as well. And then we'll reflect on that. We'll see if there's any other shared resources we wanna to add together and, and harvest the wisdom of the group for today. I will mention um, one of our speakers, Camille Ferguson, 
uh, is she had a, a, a very urgent um, change in schedule this morning. We think she's still going to be joining us on the call today. So it'll be right around the time when she presents. And if not, we still want to share a little bit of information for you about her community. So we'll dive into that conversation later. But let's start with a little check-in. If you could go to the next slide, please. So I shared a little bit about where I'm from. This is where all of our speakers are from today to give you a sense of place. Each of them is gonna talk a little bit about more, more about their communities. I see that many of you have been putting in chat already where you're from, but I would love to hear just a, an introduction from you in the chat. Um, where is home for you? Tyler, if you could go to the next slide. That's just our prompt. Where is home for you? If you wanna have an introduction that shares where is work home, where is heart home, and also, this is a great opportunity to spend a little bit of time networking. So if you want to share anything about what you do, please feel free to keep adding that in the chat. We're gathered around this idea of rural creative placemaking. So we can make some friends and future collaborations. All right. Awesome. It's great to see all the wide range of where people are coming in from. We'll be, we'll be, all of our speakers are gonna be monitoring the chat closely to see what ideas and insights you have as well. So thanks for adding to that. Uh, let's move on to the next slide. And I wanna just tell you a little bit about kind of what the spirit of this day is about and have an invitation for you, which is to make this as participatory as we can and engaging as we can. So. At the top, you'll kind of see that there are suggestions for potential actions to take. If you're able and willing, we'd love to have your video on. Our speakers are looking for that automatic feedback when they're talking, and we want to engage in conversation with you real time. And that will be especially important during a conversational part of our workshopping. So if you're able, awesome. And please feel free to use the chat at all times. Let's just keep a running conversation. You won't be interrupting anything. We wanna hear your ideas and insights as they come in real time. And then later on in the call, when we have some <clears throat> workshopping time and community conversation, I will be inviting some of you, if you'd like to unmute and ask a question or share a comment. And the best way to do that is going to be to use the raise your hand option. If you need any help with that, please just ask in the chat. You can specifically reach out to Tyler Bowders, who will be helping with tech. But that will be the quickest and fastest way so we can find you and be able to ask if you want to unmute. And then feel free to share some love with reactions or emojis. And really, this time together is about good conversation, having a spirit of collaboration, respectful dialogue, being open to different perspectives today and really supporting one another. The communities who are asking design challenge questions are going to get help from all of you in the audience. And all of you hopefully will have some really cool things that you can take back with you and be able to use in your community work as well. So, awesome. Okay, thanks for continuing to add in the chat. I love everything that's coming in and I'm getting little glimpses here and there. And also the emoji reactions, I'm seeing them and this they're happening too. Okay, so um, let's go to one more slide, please. I'm curious, and our speakers are curious to know, what is bringing you here today? What's your interest in rural creative placemaking? And maybe your work, if it's involved in rural creative, creative placemaking to some capacity. If you could share that, that would be really helpful for an upcoming dialogue. In particular, if there's any questions that you're wondering about as well. So let's keep that rolling in the chat. And what I'd like to do now is let's um, stop the slide share and I'm going to turn things over to an introduction for each of our consultants to share with you about themselves so you know where they're coming from. We're gonna start with Maria Sykes. So Maria, I'm gonna pass things over to you. Awesome, thank you, Jamie. Um... I got a couple of slides to look at, because that'll be fun. Um, my name is Maria Sykes. I call Green River, Utah home, even though I'm originally from the South. Um, for anyone who, who can't see me today, I'm a white woman in my late 30s with long, light, bro um, uh, light brown hair. My pronouns are she and her. 
Um, I am wearing Epicenter's brand new Rural and Proud shirt. Uh, these will be available Giving Tuesday. Um, <laughs> and uh, the frames of my glasses are teal. I just put on a sweater because it's chilly here. All of a sudden it's winter. I don't know what happened. Um, and you can probably tell by the sound of my voice that I usually have a pretty big smile on my face, but I definitely have one right now because I'm really excited to be here. Um, so since I was a teenager, I've been engaged in public art and design, uh, but it really took off when I attended Auburn University's architecture school, which is known uh, for the, the value of community-based design. And so I learned a ton there. And when I graduated, I ended up moving out to Green River, Utah, which is a town of about 800 people, um, where I was tasked with helping a local nonprofit develop affordable housing. Um, I was just gonna stay for a summer uh, and it turned into much more. We were able to uh, get this really cool building uh, and we started renovating this space and thinking, okay, what resources can we bring to this community? Suddenly we realized, oh, we're creating our own jobs and there's so much potential here. Um, and so a year later we had renovated the space and created a new nonprofit organization called Epicenter. And so here I am 14 years later. Um, so Epicenter uh, was, like me, it was started by artists and, and designers, but it also has a sort of economic development goal as well. So it's not just about generating um, art and design. There's very much um, the sort of more practical aspect. Usually those are separate organizations. We decided to do it all in one because that was our approach. Um, the town of Green River is, like I said, about 800 people. It's service-based. Uh, we're located in the high desert of Utah. Actually, I'm gonna go back to this photo so you can really see. This is this is Green River right here with the beautiful book cliffs in the background. See the train going through. Um, we are surrounded by over 50 miles of desert in all directions, but we're also really connected to because we're on I-70. Green River has definitely seen better days. The population has been up to 5,000. Um, so it's been through a lot of booms and busts and changes. Um, Green River is primarily a service-based or hospitality-based um, place, also a little bit of agriculture as well, and I think we're always grappling with that identity of how do you manage tourism? Uh, there's kind of the good and the bad about that, which I think is something we'll talk about a lot today. Um, this is a welcome sign that was done by the artist Lisa Ward. And I, and I want to show you guys this specifically because we did a project through the NEA Our Town back in 2016, 17, where we had a few artists work with us on different small projects leading up to us creating our downtown revitalization plan. Um, and I think we have a link to that somewhere. It's called Waypoint is, is that plan that we created. Um, and this was a project that was done again by, by Lisa Ward and it's just this, this beacon in the town now. And so on its own, it's a beautiful, wonderful object with, that people are very proud of, but it also led to bigger efforts as well. Right now, Epicenter is primarily focused on, there's about four acres downtown that we got donated by the city of Green River where we are developing affordable housing. So again, that was our original mission. We have built houses and done home repairs since then, but we've never done a multifamily housing development. So this is a rendering, uh, very expressive <laughs> collage rendering, but I wanted to give you guys some of the spirit of uh, what Green River was. It was actually done by uh, Kenny Fallon Jr. did this rendering. Um, but yeah, we design these houses, we finance these houses, we've raised all of the funds for it, and we'll hopefully be breaking ground within the next month or two, which would be tremendously exciting. Um, and then also within this project, there is a public uh, park component that was designed by uh, local residents and an artist as well. So that's a little bit about who I am and, and what I've been up to for the past 14 years. Awesome, thanks, Maria. Okay, let's turn it over to Emily Wilson. Okay. I'm just getting my screen shared here. Um, I'll also take a cue from my colleagues and just um, describe myself briefly as I'm introducing myself. Um, my name is Emily Wilson. I work for an organized nonprofit. Um, community-based organization in West Virginia. I'm based up in a town called um, Thomas, West Virginia, but our organization's in Elkin, which is a little further off the mountain. Um, my pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm a 40-year-old white woman uh, with long, dark, wavy hair. 
um, had black, big black glasses. Um, today I'm wearing kind of a pink shirt with tan cardigan, and I have kind of a white panel background behind me um, in this historic building I get to work in as a co-working space. Um, hope you can all see uh, my photos. Awesome, getting thumbs up. Um, so I started working for Woodlands Development and Lending about 10 years ago. I started as an AmeriCorps member, as a lot of community development workers do. Um, and it, at that time, I worked part-time. I served part-time as um, with Woodlands, doing community development work broadly. And I also worked in a small this small town called Thomas of about 600 people with their nonprofit uh, volunteer-led community groups, giving them some additional capacity. Yeah. And I can't believe it's been 10 years, but um, I've really learned a lot in this time. And it's been very exciting because this town of Thomas um, is where I think a lot of um, the CERD communities who have kind of interacted with are at kind of early in their re revitalization process, early in their community development um, engagement process. So I've got, kind of got to see some of the beginnings of that and now kind of moving into larger projects, larger initiatives, and thinking about um, larger challenges that we're dealing with now. Um, but on my screen, you can see this little town. Again, it's about 600 people, Thomas, West Virginia. It was a former coal mining town. Like a, a lot of the towns around here were extraction towns with railroads going through them. Um, it started to dwindle off um, in the 1960s, 70s, 80s till they, um, the mining companies pulled out and the like, train tracks were ripped up. Um, but the whole town's undermined. It's like Swiss cheese under there. And um, it presents a lot of environmental and structural problems to the town. Um, but it, in uh, about 2011, 12, a really great group of volunteers got together and said, we, we have this great downtown that actually still has a lot of built environment left in it. Um, a lot of great architecture. And the, the storefronts are vacant. There were maybe two or three filled storefronts and um, a great music venue moved in. I, I, a guy from West Virginia who just kind of took a chance that it's called the Purple Fiddle. And it kind of it started attracting a really creative group of people and they became very active in their community along with locals who had been very active. Um, and I kind of was thrown in this creative place making process, which for us really just looked like planning, design, work, um, and identifying bigger needs for the community and then prioritizing solutions to those needs. So we started with a vacant and dilapidated buildings inventory that we put together as a group of volunteers, started prioritizing buildings that needed more help than others or were more visible than others, all that kind of thing. And we also worked on a riverfront park development, redevelopment park plan as a group of people. And from there, we, you know, we took on some very small projects, very volunteer led up to, you know, very large EPA cleanup, environmental protection agency cleanup projects. Um, our organization, as I transitioned over, um, just to give you a quick background on about us. Um, um, we are ultimately, like, First and foremost, kind of affordable housing developer, nonprofit affordable housing developer of CHODO, which is a community housing development organization. Um, we build, we've built mostly multifamily in the last few years, uh, last decade, but we've also done a lot of single family development and we're doing more now. We serve mostly a three county area um, for those for that real estate development work because we really want to focus in on those three counties and do as much, have as much impact on those counties as possible. Um, we also do a lot of downtown redevelopment work. We've rehabbed a bunch of our own downtown buildings in our service area with historic tax credits and other crazy finance stacks um, and work with a lot of private building owners as well to get their buildings fixed up. We do a lot of community facilities development work with our municipalities. That's mostly giving support and capacity to our um, municipalities and helping them raise resources to create these, you know, amazing third spaces, parks, trails, community facilities, and then working on some public art. You can see here. And then we are also a community development financial institution, a CDFI. So we do small business lending and um, 
technical assistance to small business owners. So we really do like try to work really holistically in our um, service area and be really responsive to the community's needs. Uh, and we got very involved with HACK and Rural LISC when the creative placemaking um, movement became popular. So we were really fortunate to take advantage of a lot of their funding and services early on and um, continue to love to work with them. And a lot of you might know Omar, who works with CERD as well with HACK. Um, and he's been a really invaluable resource in our community, helping us through a lot of community design projects. Um, that's a little about me. <laughs> um, so we'll pass it back over um, to our communities, I think. All right, thanks so much. Okay, so now you have a little example of, or a little background on the consultants that we have today, uh, which each are their own powerhouses. So I'm really excited for you to be able to see some live workshopping. Tyler, could you share um, the slides again? Um, now we're getting into some exciting moments. Okay, everybody, with our powers combined, we are about to do some group brainstorming, mastermind, collective um, wisdom gathering. Okay, so I want to explain a little bit about how this process is going to work. Let's go over to the next slide. And what we're going to do is introduce one of our communities at a time. So you will have a chance to hear an introduction from them briefly, where they will also be talking about a project that they're working on and a particular sort of design challenge that's coming up for them in that creative placemaking work. So please listen in for the certain challenges that are coming up. And then there will be a period of time where all of us and our two consultants can start to ask questions of clarity to just learn a little bit more background and have an understanding of, hey, this part, I need to just understand a little bit more behind this in order to kind of move forward or think, think through some brainstorming ideas. Then we're going to move into some live workshopping consultation where Emily and Maria will be working their magic. And you all will have the chance to continue to contribute in the chat, bring up questions, bring up ideas. And then we're gonna open it up to all of you as a whole. And if anybody wants to unmute with a question or with an idea um, to briefly share in a kind of clear, concise way, um, raise your hand and then that will indicate to us where to find you so we can ask if you wanna unmute. And then with all of these resources that we're gathering, we'll do a harvest of the information that we're learning here together so that you have some things to take with you and everyone can kind of benefit from the total wisdom that we have in the room from all these different perspectives. Okay, does that make sense? Can I get some thumbs up or questions in the chat? Head nods, awesome. Okay, cool. Well, let's dive into our first community. So Sarah, I'm gonna pass things over to you. Why don't you give us an introduction about your place and your work? Sure thing. So I am Sarah Ayers. I currently serve as the Economic Development Director alongside the Village of Marcellus's Downtown Development Authority. Um, the Village of Marcellus is in Southwest Michigan. It's right about here. Well, you're backwards um, because it's a screen. But anyway, <laughs> near the side of Lake Michigan. Um, it's a community of a little over a thousand people and historically has been largely agricultural with some industry. Um, as an aside, I, and this will make sense, I promise you, I'm also a doctoral student looking at knowledge sharing within community-led arts organizations, specifically in rural spaces. And one day as I was doing my nerd research, I stumbled upon CERD's design challenge. And I don't know how we got in because it was very close to the deadline um, that we ended up becoming part of their design challenge cohort. Um, and I, I'm trying to make this somewhat quick because I'm very excited for feedback, but the challenge that we identified is, and I think that this is similar probably to a lot of, of rural spaces, um, is we have a campaign that's been around for as long as I can remember. I'm 40. Um, I just realized too, I forgot to describe myself. I'm a 40-ish white woman with short, dark hair, and I'm wearing a black and white striped sweater. Um, but our... Our challenge is we have this campaign that's 36 lakes within six miles. So we have really incredible natural assets. The problem is translating that into activation in our downtown commercial corridor. Um, 
So to put it in perspective, we have obviously a lot of second homeowners that are on the lakes. Um, a lot of them, a lot of the homes are upwards of a million dollars. Um, so there's money there, but our current downtown status is largely inactive. Um, it's been a real struggle to find businesses and support businesses. That being said, I think it's important as we think about the challenge um, is that we do have one business, which I kind of consider the heart of downtown, and it is um, a multi-generational -gener um, market called Terrell's Market, and it's been around for a long time. They are known widely for having really high quality meat in their market, and people do come in from the lakes to support that. So we're kind of in a chicken and egg situation, right? How do we get developers and businesses to see that Marcellus is viable? Um, Terrell's kind of being the perfect case study, right? Like they, they will come in, but then how do we also get the folks off of the lake and into the community when there are only one or two active spaces? Oh, there it is. There's Terrell's. Um, so this is, I think again, like many small communities, um, largely developed in the 1870s to 1890s. So a lot of potential for activation, um, not just commercial activation, but for um, for residential spaces above the businesses. Um, and then I think there's a second slide if you wanna click to that one that, there we are. Um, and there you can see, it's another kind of image of our community, um, but also of, of the campaign that we have. So, um, that's kind of a brief intro to paint a picture of, of our downtown. Um, and I would love to maybe start asking some questions. I'm not sure if I should prompt or just move forward with that, but. Yeah, Sarah, go ahead. If, if there are other questions that you wanna bring up, ask them right now, and then we're gonna bring in Maria and Emily. Awesome. That'd be great. Um, so I have my, my two questions that I'm really looking forward to discussing with everyone. Um, the first one is, you know, how do we fund a project once a plan is developed? Um, we're really fortunate to be part of CERD, um, and we've been, and I love that it's very holistic and that we address a lot of things from community building and really thinking about how to engage our communities. Um, and I think the question always on everyone's mind is how do we fund that project? Um, I think Marcellus, like many communities, is running on limited capacity. Everyone says, go for grants, go for grants. You know, grants aren't guarantees um, and they require a lot of time and they require a lot of capacity. So I work in a part-time capacity with the village um, and then we have one full-time village manager who's, manager who's responsible for incredible amounts of work. Um, so how do we think, um, or I guess my actual full question is, uh, we're directed to our grant programs to fund projects, but it would be interesting to hear how other communities and projects were funded through alternative funding sources. Okay. Awesome, Sarah. Okay, so there's a few things for everybody to think about. Um, before we start diving into solutions, mm -hmm. um, let's bring in Maria and Emily. And I'm curious if either of you have any questions of clarity to ask Sarah to just know a little bit more about background. The same for all of you, our community at large. Are there any questions of clarity that could help you start thinking about some solutions that you might throw out? Bring them up now. Okay. Yeah. Maria, so for, for the organization or the facility that you're talking about, have you already started the plan? So we've just been working on... <laughs> We really started the 36 Lakes campaign when we launched into the CERD program um, and trying to get a better understanding of how to even move forward in a project like that. Um, how do we think about creating a plan and then implementing said plan and funding said plan? So we're really at the early phases of that. So I would love any sort of thoughts along the way. We have a very similar gotcha. initiative. Um, Sorry, you came. You want to go? No, no, no. <laughs> I was saying that was my primary question. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, we have a very similar initiative. It's a little bigger area, but um, we, I live in a national forest and um, was a part of this Mon Forest Towns Initiative, Monongahela Forest, um, and really like dedicated F recreational tourism effort. Sounds like um, similar to your lakes project and um, trying to market the area together, trying to build business, small business, trying to you know revitalize downtowns, and it just became bigger and bigger. Um, 
you know, all the partners involved, all these community representatives wanted to do different things in their communities. And it, we started to be like, oh, we have to do everything. Um, but it really helped to kind of very intentionally sit down with partners and community members to come up with a strategic plan and also a play, kind of a place-based design plan as well. And there were many um, design plans involved, but, and then we kind of like narrowed down, here are the things we can control <laughs> and that we um, do have capacity for. And these are the things we do have partners that can handle, but we'd like to like, you know, feed our um, knowledge that way of our communities. And it's been growing. It's still, it's still kind of in, in its infancy, but I think like really getting everyone around the table, this is nothing like <laughs> um, super um, revolutionary, but, um, and then kind of really seeing who's around the table, what capacity you do have first and what strengths you have first, all of that um, really starts to narrow down um, what you can do. Um, uh, Jamie, J well, I was going to ask Jamie, are we asking clarifying questions or are we going jumping into solutions already? Just just clarifying questions right now. Oh, okay, so oh, sorry. Balancing, balancing <laughs> out, no, it's all good. I was, out the last I was, thing I was eager said. to jump in. Yeah, sorry, I jumped in. <laughs> let's do let's do one more minute around clarifying questions. Yeah. Bouncing off of what Emily had just said, I saw a couple questions come in. So one was, do you know what the community wants, Sarah? And who's at the table? And then the other question is, what local philanthropic partners do you have? Any community foundations? So can you speak to those things? Ooh, yeah, that's like a list of questions. Um, I think that most people want a bar and restaurant. They want someplace mm -hmm. to go. Um, I think again that falls into the chicken and egg, you know, right? Is the community going to support it and how? Um, the community partners and I guess folks involved in the conversation, we try to be pretty um pretty open to listening. I know that we're really working now more intentionally to be more public facing. I think a lot of times it's very easy for municipal bodies to kind of stay within this box. Um, and I know that there's more intention, especially recently to be more involved and active in the community. For example, we recently did an Oktoberfest event that was outside and, and really meant to be community building. So that's something that we're working with. Um, and then in terms of larger philanthropic partners, that's a good question. Um, I know that there are some organizations um the one that comes to mind really is one that's more focused on like entrepreneurial skill building and sharing um which is a local community organization i'll do some thinking about that one let me kind of flush out <laughs> i mean i know that there are i think ones that are specific to the to this question well, yeah. Lori, Lori Bellingham and I have are on the same wavelength. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering also about like seasonal population. So like you talked about the lakes and their second homes. Um, like what's the kind of people who live here all the time population versus like what's the what are the swells and when do they happen? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. So our year round population is a little over a thousand. Um, I don't know if we have the data in terms of the influx of folks in the summer. I think part of that is that they again they stay on the lakes, so it's hard for businesses to say like, oh, our increase was X, Y, and Z through the summer because why drive six miles when there are two locations when you can drive ten miles mm -hmm. and go where there's every big box store you would ever want. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not sure those numbers, but that would be interesting. Do you have any um, kind of other industries besides kind of the tourism, mm -hmm. the lakes, um, um, in your in your region? Yes. Yeah, so um, it's like I say, it's largely agricultural. Yeah, um, a lot of farming. There are two industrial businesses actually in the village limits. Um, one is Faith Classics and one's Metalcasters. So mm -hmm. we're manufacturing um, largely automotive. Yeah. Okay, and let's do um, kind of the final Q and A before we jump into kind of more design and solution ideas. Um, how many affordable rental and homeowners do you have in the community? It's primarily homeowners. Um, we had one apartment complex that was affordable housing that had a fire um, within the last couple of years. And I know that's being rebuilt, but I, I don't believe it's at full capacity. Um, but because there are a lot of homeowners and it's such a small town, there aren't a lot of rentals um, in the community. Okay. All right. Maria, Emily, what yeah. ideas do you have? Also, I'll point out there was one kind of question slash idea of maybe partnering with community colleges. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, you so, go ahead, Maria, since I already... <laughs> I'm going to try to summar, I'm gonna try to <laughs> summarize it. So my understanding is that basically you're trying to figure out how to create an operating budget for a space slash organization, right? Um, and so I think understanding like where all the sources of income could come from. So you have like your private donations, you have your government, which is, it could be the office of tourism. There's so many different things that you could look at recreation. I'm not sure what your state has. Um, and then there is the possibility of having taxes in your community that you could, I mean, if you're the city body. So like in Utah, we have a recreational arts and parks tax. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, not what's, I'm not sure what's available there, but that's something you could potentially pull from. And then I think the other piece where you can be really creative is specifically earned income. I think there's this concept that like nonprofits can't get funds, right? Like you can't sell stuff and make profit. Yes, you can. You just are never paying that to shareholders because you don't have them. It would be amazing if every year you were always in the black, right? And so when I say earned income, that's selling t-shirts like my nonprofit does. It's uh, contracting. It's renting the space. Um, it's buying a boat and like selling stuff out on the lake to people like if you have to go to them like whatever it is it's figuring out what these things are these services and and things that you can provide and get get really creative and I would highly encourage you to get like kind of outside um of that space that you're creating and then the other the question I asked about um where are you in the planning um I'm excited to hear that you're at the very beginning stages because I think you need to create a team that you are the minority in and so that's you know somebody from the schools it's uh, somebody from one of the foundations that you want to support it it's people that are going to support the ongoing operations whether it's in kind or financially and then of course anyone in your community who's like marginalized so I think those are my kind of big immediate things I'll let Emily talk for a minute mm -hmm. yeah I mean you hit on the big one is just kind of coming up with the partner list like I said and like Maria said of like not the usual suspects too sometimes it and finding that champion the community champion that can rally everyone better than like I could as a nonprofit worker or something um but you know the artists you know that's obviously a big one here in this creative place making space the entrepreneurs themselves you know you mentioned this kind of catalyst business um getting I'm sure they want more foot traffic too like trying to get as many of them involved um and then yeah, any kind of municipal leadership, churches are always have a lot of all, you know, seem to have a lot of volunteers and schools and all that. Um, we have, like I said, we have national forests, so getting forest service involved and some, you know, these larger partners if possible. Um, I do, we're trying to do, we have a similar kind of tourism second home community, and we have never been like adequately able to tap that wealth that comes into the community. Like you, like, it's it's there. It's like right adjacent to these towns. We feel like they love this place. They do have a, they come back, you know, they have family memories here. We honestly have not had the um, success yet of tapping that. The community foundation hasn't that, had that success. And we're still trying to figure that out. So all that to say, like, maybe someone in your, you, you all can figure out a creative solution to really kind of tug it the second homeowners are heartstrings who tend to have a little more money and figure out how to get some donations out of them too. But we haven't yeah, solved think, that. So I'd like to hear yeah. it. <laughs> well, I was gonna say like the, I think the easiest thing to do is like have a good party, right? I mean, figure <laughs> out figure out why they're coming there, um, but also like maybe they're not wanting to leave their space. Like they're in their home and they're there for a retreat. So do you put something on their door, like a little flyer or something like figuring out and get, going out there and getting to them and, hopefully you'll have a few bites and just getting to know those people because they're a part of the community as well, just in a different way. So I also see that Eva has a raised hand and I wonder Eva, if you'd like to unmute and share a question or a idea. Sure, so um, I am with Georgia Tech. So I think I put it in the chat, but it goes so fast. Not everybody got to see it probably, but I'm with Georgia Tech, we're a university center. ADA University Center. So I work in the Center for Economic Development Research. Um, so while our offices are in Midtown Atlanta, most of the places that we serve are in rural Georgia. I've lived in rural Georgia my whole life. Um, and I now live in rural North Georgia, which is somewhat similar to some of these areas you're talking about, like with the whole second home situation on many, we have a lot of lakes up here, right? So it's like, 
two hours from like all the money and people in the world of Atlanta and they, you know, they come for their weekend getaway. And so um, I know, you know, different state laws are completely different, but I, I know one of the things that a lot of the communities um, that sort of have that, that dichotomy there um, are looking at are sort of making sure their Airbnbs are paying their hotel motel tax because, Sometimes they weren't and there wasn't a good inventory of that. Um, and so that could be a piece that, you know, that you're missing out on. Also, um, you know, we're, we're doing some some government stuff like some impact fees. So if you are building, you know, this huge home um, that you're sort of paying your fair share of parks and those kind of things that really go to serve the everyday residents, Um you know, I mean, on the one hand, it's good because those folks aren't calling on your services, you know, overcrowding your schools, but then are they really an integrated part of your community? Um, so I just think thinking through those kind of things and making sure that, that those monies are, if you're, if you're going to do something like that, that you're getting it back, like that it's not just going in the general fund and just kind of like getting petered out as things do. Um, but I also like the, I think it was Emily brought up the idea of how you engage some of those folks. We get a lot of folks here, um, you know, retired executives out of Atlanta that sort of live in this big gated community. And how do you, um, how do you tap into that? Uh, you know, even if they're not retired, if they're semi-retired, like at the executive level, and they've got five more years to work, sometimes those big corporations, you know, will match um, a, a donation. And those folks are, are looking to do, they're, they're, they're not like me, right? So the IRS pays me back at the end of every year. <laughs> These people are paying the IRS at the end of every year. So I think if you could do some kind of foundation or something like that, and then type in, tap into that corporate funding for a match, um, the, the match is the individual stuff, right? Then you can sort of two for one your money. So that, those are just a couple of sort of Georgia centric examples. Thank you, Eva. So Maria, bring up any reactions? Uh, yeah, no, it immediately also made me think of, um, I'm not sure what kind of other taxes you have in your community, Sarah, but um, we also have like a transient room tax, a resort tax, and all of these things that come back to the community that are then used um, for advertising and for building infrastructure. So that's Utah, but there also might be some sort of equivalent, or maybe there's something that you can develop. And that's something that's going to take a really long time, but like, as you build on it, it's like, it's going to be super sustainable. And I think as you're thinking about that operating budget, like how do you make it diverse? You don't want to depend it on just rich people. You don't want it dependent just on grants mm -hmm. and you don't want it dependent just on taxes or earned income, but like developing all these things, like, you know, all at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. Even all this other fundraising takes so much capacity to want to recognize that, you know, <laughs> all of these things we're talking about, it, it's someone has to be doing the outreach and the gathering of people and all of that too. And that's really hard in our rural communities and these small nonprofits, especially who aren't as established and don't have, you know, like we're lucky we have a lot of rental properties we can um, pull operating funds from or developer fees and things. But we know that's not the case with everyone. We, in in Thomas and especially all throughout our region, AmeriCorps and Vistas have been huge to like fill a little bit of that capacity. They're, often young, but some of them have more experience than others. And um, they, especially with kind of um, volunteer management and some of those pieces, but even with some grant writing, if they're VISTA, um, that is a huge, fairly cheap way <laughs> to um, bring a lot of capacity and energy and knowledge and, um, and they can do some of that work too. So I know that's not the fundraising, but the, the capacity question is one we're always wrestling with for sure. Yeah. I started as an AmeriCorps VISTA, so <laughs> fully in the same board of that. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes VISTAs uh, dig in and get stuck. Another thing that made me think about this when you were talking about, Emily, the a labor of doing this work emotionally, time and all of those sorts of things is that when you're thinking about the people that you potentially want to make an ask from, you might consider having them actually join your team. Um, hey, I want to bring you in to help 
uh, make some asks towards this and then that's, it's going to empower them and I'm sure they're going to contribute as well and so I think it goes into like whether it's a foundation or someone who has a second home that really wants to contribute to the community like bring those people onto your team of volunteers um, don't you know some people are obviously just just ask them for support but then there's going to be some people that you could really empower that could kind of uh, give you some sort of access that you don't already have okay and for now we're going to leave it at that we are going to circle back around everybody and just kind of review the ideas that have been coming up there has been an amazing amount of ideas coming through the chat so sarah i want to mm -hmm. just let you know that to, to spend a little time looking there but then um, amanda on our team is working very hard at capturing all of the notes from the chat <laughs> and we're going to circle back after all these conversations and take a look at what we've come up with together so Moving forward, we're going to move on to our next speaker, but if you have thoughts specifically for Sarah in the chat, please just put Sarah's name before it so we know which comment or idea goes towards which person. So thank you, Sarah. Thank and you. I'm I'm going to turn things over next to Demelia to share. Hello. Can you all hear me? Yes. Awesome. All right. Hello. Thank you for the opportunity. Super thankful to be here. I'm Demelia Adamson from Hugo, Oklahoma. I'm a creative photographer. I wear different hats um, from social services to the industrial board for our city. Um, I'm 27. I have glasses, bangs, red sweater with the flannel under. Uh, I'm here at the uh, Chalksaw Nation Travel Plaza to get good Wi-Fi. So, those are the big windows that you um, that I that's in my screen. And a little bit about Hugo. So, I am an alumni, and my goal is to bring opportunity back. A little bit about Hugo. Four stoplights, five thousand in population. So, there's about sixty-four seniors right now. Um, formerly known as the Circus Town, we have an elephant sanctuary. Um, we're on tribal land and we're known for our rodeo in Juneteenth. That's one of our big events. So everyone knows everyone. Um, driving five to ten minutes across town is a little inconvenient. Um, there's not a consistent space for youth programming and family engagement. And there's also a lack of access to resources, which has resulted in a lack of hope. So our mission, Project Gains mission, is to build Hugo one project at a time trying to eliminate poverty by giving uh, everyone the tools, especially our youth, the tools that they need. So when there's a need, we fill it, we address it with creativity by pulling everyone together, um, very hands-on. So from alumni career day to little league, nutrition class, you name it. Um, and we have a strong foundation with our director introducing Boys and Girls Club and little league cheer into the area um, years ago. So moving forward to the next slide, our overall goal is to have a recreational and training facility. We have the vision, we have the people, we have a clean slate to be as creative as possible. Um, right now, we need to take action on our first step with this new building we have here, which was actually a former segregated school and a, a narcotics unit um, years later. So on the next slide, my first question is, am I able to hop into my first two questions by explaining these slides? All right. Yes, please go for it. Nice. Um, my first question is, let me tell you about this slide first. Four rooms right here that you see, office, um, the cafe, studio, and the workhouse for one of our programs for students to have work study jobs, especially that are under the age to work. And then that is that long hallway. So the first question is how to maximize and create multi-purpose spaces in our building with four rooms size 26 by 29 to cater to all of our programs. That's question one. And on the next slide, you will see the outdoor space, two concrete slabs in the front with the parking lot. Right in front of that parking lot, you see it's kind of elevated a little bit like a stage. And then in the back, there's two circle concrete slabs and a nice wonderful tree in that whole space and sidewalks. 
and going to the next slide as well, you'll see that some of our youth and male mentors networking together, and they have started to paint the side of the building to prepare for mural or some sort of art that will be on the side of the building. So question two are, what are the steps we can take to integrate art culture design while preserving history for the inside and outside renovations to connect with everyone as a whole? And those are my two questions. Awesome, thanks Amelia. Okay, let's bring back Maria and Emily. And for all of you, out in the crowd, let's hear what clarifying questions are coming up. But I'll, I'll turn first to Marie and Emily. What more would you like to hear about for contextual background from Demelia? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I, got, I got questions. Yeah. Um, how do folks in your community feel? Uh, like, are there feelings around this space? Like, is there yeah can you talk about that a little bit like i guess I would, in history and like currently i would say um this space hasn't really been utilized to its full potential it has been vacant for years um for the longest i didn't know that it was a narcotics unit i knew it used to be a segregated school and that area i would say um uh, trying to think of a nice way to say this it, it is the more lower income side of the town. Um, I will say it is convenient as far as programming wise for everyone to get to though. So it would be convenient with anyone stepping into this area and turning into something, it could really, really benefit Hugo. Did I answer your question? Yeah, totally. And then I guess to, to follow up with that, um, is this space going to be like project gain space? Is it a community space? Like who, who's going to, who's going to run it? And then uh, what's, is there a budget? What does that look like? Great question. I didn't mean to add on that outdoor space. We would like that to be an outdoor public space using art for that. And Everyone, we serve everyone. We do have hands-on programming for youth, but we grab that family in between. That building right next to it is actually a food bank. And there's another building on that same lot that serves seniors every week food um, to eat. And there's another unit that's not being used yet. Um, so everyone will be able to use it. Project Gain will be operating the building as far as programming, um, but we do believe in legacy and leadership and true leadership is we should be able to create something and then if I'm there or not, it still goes and that's our main goal. Yeah, and you've been part of the third program with PAC, is that correct? Is yes. that what I heard last week? And have you started working with a designer? You may have mentioned this, but. Not oh, yet. Not yet, okay. Yeah or architects or anyone? Not yet. No? Okay. There is a question in the chat right now from Travis Green that I think you started speaking towards this a little bit, Amelia, but could you elaborate just a little bit more on where the facility is located in the community by describing other places and however you'd like to share about it? I'm sorry, say that one more time and I'm pulling up the chat now. Oh yeah, the question is just where's the facility in the community? So I know you've talked about like what's next to it, but maybe if you could explain just a little bit more. Yes, so it's right off the highway actually of 271. Um, next to it is a, a lower income housing unit actually. Um, and there's a railroad, there's a, a few residential spots there. Um, and then there's a park as well, I can't forget that Corley Road Park that was donated to our community um, that has a whole backstory. So that's kind of right there in the area and it's, it's actually on the edge of town. So leaving town, we're not too far from the border of Texas, probably about 10 minutes crossing the water. Okay, Emily, Maria, do you have any other questions that you'd like to ask or do you wanna jump into some design solutions? Um, I think I have one other question in terms of, I wonder if there isn't a step before 
designing and going for it or or if they're within the design process it's not just like looking at the spaces and saying this is what we need but maybe there's some like temporary possibilities and so i don't know if this is a solution but before kind of jumping in and like let's let's go now let's this you know this space is going to be this and that i wonder if there's a way to do pop-up things Mm -hmm. or uh some temporary installations and just like experimenting and seeing what it is that the community wants the space to be and i say that because i don't know what your budget is but if you commit to something thinking you know what you want it to be you might not be right because you you know you've never done it before. You we you know it's kind of hard to know what the community wants and needs. And so I wonder if there's a process that you can go through to figure out what those wants and needs are, and some emotions even like understanding a lot of that, what the space really needs to be, and then that can inform your design. A great designer can take that information and the different things that you're doing, um, and and hopefully help you create a space that makes a lot of sense for your community. That's a um great input and i'm on the budget i would say our budget (laughs) we have big dreams so i don't know what that looks like number wise because we do have other things after this right um but i will say that we have started looking into funding and it has started coming in so now that we have it how can we effectively Mm -hmm. spend it and then not just us pulling things in but oh this not going this is not going to work you know um so I don't know how to answer yeah. the budget question, but I will say on the rooms, did you have any questions on the title of the rooms that we had on the cafe, the workspace? No, I don't think so. I, you know, I think someone can come in and design those spaces. I don't think we can like live design them mm-hmm. for you right now, but I think if, yeah. if you've done the work in your community and those are definitely like, you know, that's what people want, then, you know, start moving forward with it. But I think when you have like a, if you have a small budget, been there i've been there like i understand it start small do it in phases start with like what's the what's the piece we need right now is it the cafe is it the office like what is it and so like starting there and then it'll grow from there because what you're going to need is you're going to need some i mean some of the great photos that you have but as you start going say okay we finished this space we need you to give us twenty thousand dollars that we can do this next phase and so you could kind of design as you go i mean that's kind of how i did it here we were literally really demoing this building as we're asking for money to to rebuild it and so you just kind of just go with it you know when you don't have the money yes I like that. Yeah. and i see some some of the hometown folks and the director there there is very limited in funding and my director said we don't have a budget yeah <laughs> yeah I've, I've been there too for sure yeah i think any of these you know, we've had a, had a lot of vacant spaces in the town I work in, but still do in a lot of our other areas. But and ju- but just getting anyone in the space, if it's as long as it's safe and sanitary for to have the public in there, like and around it, like just getting people on site to, um, yeah, maybe they have some memories of that site, or maybe like some good ideas come out of people who can like they're on the site and they're imagining. The possibilities around it so that could be events that bring them in it could be a design charrette or um, some sort of planning we're big planners in my organization so like a planning process with as many stakeholders as possible to try to imagine what you know the highest and best uses of that space are and what the community really wants to see there and then yeah that kind of starts to naturally um, go into a design phase then later and often you know you know when I mean, as you're bringing more people on the property you never know who's going to be there too that might have some access to small pots of money here and there too um and i totally agree with maria like yeah taking it in small chunks can work really well if you don't <laughs> if you don't have all the money at one time but yeah just getting people there i feel like is really important and it looks like you're doing some of that already yeah I think in terms of the design advice I can give you is to keep it as flexible as possible. Because when I think about what my community needs, we just need a big room that we can gather where we can have a family reunion, a baby shower. We need a kitchen. We need bathrooms. You know, it's like just keep it simple and like get those essential things and, you know, start thinking about like, do we need a sound system? Do we need a projector? Some of those and where where's the best space for it? And just keep it really flexible. So by saying 
this room is only an office, you might be limiting yourself, you know, you know, are, are there walls that might be able to knock down to make it an even bigger indoor gathering space? I think there's a lot of possibilities. So you might want to, like I said, almost take a step back. Um, Cause you may have decided, you may think that you've decided uh, what needs to be in there and you might, might start rethinking it a little bit once you really start digging in and getting people's opinions and stuff. And I think you, I think bringing in an architect or a designer and helping, you know, an, or an artist to help you start investigating this process. It could be someone within the community or someone from outside of the community to just help you move through that process. And I think you could find somebody at the, the state level or that would, you know, pay for that. Um, or maybe one of your possible funders can, you know, give a stipend to an artist to start creating some events where you start drawing. What can this space be? Have people list all the different things, you know, just start riffing on ideas and suddenly it'll all start coming together. We, we've had a lot of luck with our landscape architecture um, department at our West Virginia University. Those students, you know, they're looking for projects for their master's degree and things too. So we've gotten a lot of very cheap <laughs> assistance through the student, the college students too, and the grad students. So that, I don't know if you have a university kind of in your region, but that's another kind of design type of resource to look toward. There's lots of resources coming through the chat. So Demelia, uh, after we're kind of closing out with this section, there will be a lot for you to review. And then we're also capturing these too, but um, people are asking about or, or giving ideas of what are the assets in your community, kind of listing some of the ones that you've mentioned, asking about broadband and potential partnerships with um, service providers, schools, youth, um, and Emily and Maria, I'm, I'm kind of curious, as you were mentioning this track of like charrettes or pop-ups, could you provide just some examples of what might that process look like? I know Maria, you mentioned a little bit, um, but maybe just kind of give a sense of what could a, a charrette be or how could it be helpful? And also what could some pop-ups be that would be very low or no cost that would allow people to help envision the space? Yeah, for for us, things that that we've done here and are, I've done in other spaces is literally it's you know it's get it's getting things on the wall that people can write on or respond to, different questions or things you could put stickers on. Yes, I like this. No, I don't like that. Real real easy stuff. But then, you know, I I I, I feel like you've talked a little bit about. Um, like folks need help with basic needs. So partner up with the food bank and do a dinner, um, you know, make, make sure there's food there and there's music and it's fun. It's not like the stuffy design workshop, but it's like actually a fun thing to be at and it'll be, it'll be successful. Um, and when I say pop-up, it just means that you, you know, you plan quite a bit, but then you literally just like put a bunch of stuff up and put it on the walls and, it, you know, there's a makeshift kind of kitchen dinner situation and uh, so somebody's made a stage for a DJ or whatever it is, right? Like it's, it's real simple, quick, easy and cheap and don't spend a lot of money on anything. Yeah, I, um, some of our pop-ups, I think, you know, sometimes it's a small business that kind of hosts it and they're, um, you know, trying to promote their business, but also, you know, a lot of small town entrepreneurs are very creative and can come up with good ideas. But yeah, I think meals are always a good option. I am a huge potluck fan. Um, and I think small rural communities are in general. <laughs> um, and I also, I, I do think though, any kind of planning charrette process um, or event that you're hosting, like child care is a big piece too, that's really important. Um, I think feeding people is important. I think um, providing some level of something so you can get some younger families in there too who might be really overburdened with caring for their children after work or whenever too. Um, but in terms of design charrettes, I think, you know, I there's people who are way better at that kind of thing than me, um, very creative people. But I've seen it done in lots of different ways. And sometimes it's just, yeah, taking maps or the building layout and having people write on it, like Marie said, on the wall. Sometimes it starts with kind of a need-based assessment or an asset-based assessment or both, kind of just to even figure out what some options for reuse could be um, before you even kind of get to really drawing and um, 
sketching out ideas. But again, like someone who's in landscape architecture or a really community-based, community-minded architect, they, they're going to have really creative ideas about how to get people around the table and designing as a community. Um, but just getting people there is the biggest deal, I think. Yeah, it's a, and it's food, kids, music are like the main things. And thanks for bringing up the, the child care component, Emily, because I think a lot of people are like, oh, we need to have someone there who's gonna watch the kids. But I'd encourage you to take it a step further, which is something that we do is we, we create kids activities that are part of the charrette. So we've had kids, you know, draw the coolest community center you can think of. And, and they're gonna draw some wild stuff. Like I've seen UFOs and all kinds of stuff. But when you actually look at those drawings, you see real data and you see what those kids want you're going to see a basketball you're going to see food you're going to see smiling faces all that sort of stuff and it's very real so I think you know talking talking to the kids are the future of your community and figure out what it is that they want to yes and I love that we also don't have a kitchen yet there's no plumbing underneath the rooms or for the rooms so we're working on trying to put a portable kitchen and figure out how to as far as running water for the kitchen set. So that's one of our challenges. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. Okay, well, we're gonna leave it at that for now. We'll circle back around again, but thanks to Amelia for sharing and lots of really good conversation. And Thank we you. are going to move over to spotlighting Camille Ferguson next, who's going to share about her community. And Tyler, if you could pull up the slides for um, Camille as well. We're really excited to hear about this third and final um, community. Hi, Camille. Good morning or good afternoon in some places. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Um, my name is Camille Ferguson. I am Klingat, um, Alaska native, um, living in a beautiful place called Sitka, Alaska. And I wanna thank all of you for taking the time to listen in, and on having our um, help along the way to help help address some of the issues that not only I face, but other people in places like Sitka, Alaska. And I'm sharing with this first slide just to give everybody a perspective of where Sitka is and in on Alaska. It's in the southeast panhandle of Alaska, just north of Seattle, south of Juneau. Um, the next slide, I'm gonna kind of go through this. Um, you know, one of our things that Sitka is a very unique place and it's beautiful and it right now currently has a wonderful sense of place. Um, however, we are being um, like a lot of communities inundated with visitors that are curious to find out about our community. Um, we went from 240,000 cruise ship visitors to 550,000 cruise ship visitors this year and anticipating that same amount next year. So if you go to the next slide real quick, like you can see that Sitka is really beautiful. It's got a balance of Clinket culture, Russian history, US military history, and definitely has the natural beauty. Um, however, it does have room to tell its story. And I think, and I'm thinking through art, it may, but if you go to the next slide too, um, you can kind of see how well our community is um, actually, you know, kind of getting very well, you know, it's bringing in the people. It, industry is very high here. Um, and I th and I'm thinking to myself, it, it needs work. And I think the work that it needs, I think it needs direction. And I think the direction can come from arts and culture and it can disperse the people a little better and, and not have them so congested. But I just just would love to everyone to kind of take a look at these images and in your head kind of get a feel of the sense of place that may have changed a little bit from 22,000 or 24,000 visitors to 550,000. So if you want to go to the following slide, I believe that's um, the next slide, please. Oh, okay, I guess that was it. Okay, but the questions are right there. So my questions definitely, you know, um, you know, the three questions that I had on that last slide is, you know, how can how can we have um, a good quality visitor experience utilizing art? How can we have local quality of life utilizing art? And then again, how can art design and creative place meaning bolster the indigenous our people, the Klingat people? Um, 
um, sustainability and quality of visitors experience. And so that's my slide and that's kind of my challenge. And I wanna share that with you. And I look forward to hearing anything that can help. Awesome, thank you, Camille, for sharing. So let's bring Maria and Emily back into the room. And okay, I think you all are getting the hang of this. Let's open it up first for questions of clarity. What background context could we use a little bit more information on to help us create some good solutions for Camille? What would you all like to know? And I'm gonna pass it to Emily and Maria first. I was kind of, yeah, I lived in a tourism community too. I'm so glad to meet you last week, Camille, at Hack and a couple of you others too. Um, it, is the tourism community like really in and out on the cruise ships or do people have like the second home or like do people stay long, tourists and like visitors stay longer too? Or is it kind of like very in and out, if that makes sense? Mm -hmm. I, I'm not as familiar with that kind of tourism. Yeah, the cruise industry, they normally, you know, disembark um, from the cruise ships in the morning and then they flood the town and then they're gone by two to four o'clock. And then keep in mind that the, yes, the cruise industry, we still have 100,000 of okay. independent travelers that come on okay. yachts and other places. That's what I was wondering. How many other? Yeah, you might have said that. Hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. I'm not sure if I have clarifying questions yet. I mostly just have thoughts possibly. Um, Cause okay. I think it's, well, re it's really, well, I'll say it's really challenging as, as an outsider to understand the needs of an indigenous community. Mm -hmm. And so I think that would be the first thing is like, do do you feel like you understand the needs of, of your community and, and desires, wants, beliefs, emotions around all of these things. And I think, um, you know, writing those down, um, is going to help create some sort of direction and, and possibly consensus if if it's possible. I think that is a very, very good point and writing them down. Um, we're on a task force now in a kind of a real, you know, and we have every segment of the community participating in it. But the indigenous community um, really wants to keep our autonomy and let people know that you know it, it it's not a russian town as it was portrayed marketing wise by the industry mm -hmm. but it, there are indigenous people that are there and we're still there and um i think that i think that maybe you know after being part of the place making i think that's I think that's, you know, the whole community really wants to make sure that we keep that sense of place and where you are. And no matter how many people are visiting, we really want people to know, you know, what kind of community they are visiting. And the crowding, I think, is is how how do we we keep that with that many people coming in and out so that they know that they've experienced one of the 224 tribes that are in the state of Alaska when it's kind of you can't see beyond the head in front of you. Can you say a little bit about the kind of indigenous art and culture that you want to help elevate through this and then there's a whole bunch of other questions in the chat I want to ask. Um, yeah, the the kind of art I think that I would like I, I would like to see more of the the clinket form art in um, you know on places like there you've seen that bridge that went across it would be really beautiful I think just to you know even the yachts that are going by they would realize that they're in an indigenous town um, and then I would also envision. I don't know. I, you know, I had some ideas when I, we visited other places, when we visited the place in, um, was it Fisher? But they had this good sense of place. And I was just, you know, like even, tr even having like herring swimming on the sidewalk leading to the herring rock. People will follow these, you know, and they have a sort of a direction. And then there was that picture, picture of the Raptor Center. There's just a wall that people are walking through. And so, yeah, I am. Um, I have ideas, you know, and, and I think it's it's seeing other places that give you the examples. And so, yeah, I'm jot, going to jot down all your exam, our, all your questions, and and bring them to the task force as well. Okay, awesome. And okay, so Emily and Maria, I want to um, pass it over to you in just a second. But there's a, so many good questions in the chat, so I just want to see if we can kind of roll through those. Um, one of them, let's see. 
Is is there or are there um, safe spaces for local and, and indigenous people to gather that are separate from the tourist population? Not at this point. Um, there is a place. I mean, there's the the Sitka National Historical Park, which was really that commemorates the battle between the Russians and the Clinket, and pretty much is where the people will get their their taste of the native art and the wild and you know edible medicinal plants that are a part of the tour program. But it is too in getting inundated with people going in there, but a safe place just for the native people, you know, we're working on trying to establish a place out at Stargaven and creating a, uh, a place where you can do immersion and learn, you know, where we can still teach in a place that is away from the big crowds. So um, at this point, the answer is no. Okay. Um, and then what is the community like in the off tourist season? What happens then? Um, everything really slows down. And this is another, this is, this is where the sense of place is, I think is really important for when the community does get to embrace our community that in the downtown area, and we talked about this last night, all the stores converted into tourist shopping. So there is no Ben Franklin no general store. Um, there is a pharmacy, but there is no downtown, really downtown shopping anymore for the local people. If I want to buy a pair of socks, I go to the grocery store. If, you know, there is nothing, like if you, it, it, that sense of community is being diluted. And I think, you know, and our fear is, and I think that's where I think art is going to come into play, is really encouraging our artists to step up their their game so we don't get the jewelry stores coming in that are on the cruise ships that are taking over the other communities. Okay. And then um, I'm trying to combine some of the questions, and I know we're not hitting on all of them, but I'll ask this last one. And then if there's others in the chat, maybe Camille, you can go back and kind of see if you want to respond at this moment. But um, has any strategic planning been done on the city's part? On the what, excuse me? On, this, on the city's part, has there been strategic planning done? Um, I, we are actually working, there has been strategic plans, but nobody planned this huge amount of people coming in. Um, and nobody really planned the city didn't really plan this because the people that are actually bringing helping bringing in are on the private dock that people can pull in the large mega ships. And so now the city is doing a strategic plan and looking at congestion and, and looking at that now. And this is a really good time to get feedback from, I think, other people kind of looking at it and may have experienced it to bring it to the table. So this is perfect timing. Okay. All right, Emily, Maria, let's turn it to you. We have a lot of topics in this one, but in five minutes, what solutions can you come up with? <laughs> I, I really want to visit. <laughs> I want to be, I want to be one of the visitors. Um, it's such an interesting design challenge to um, I can imagine designers really um, being excited about, especially this like dispersal of people, like how to do that how in an efficient way, but also like, yeah, creative way and then supporting the businesses and all of that would be super interesting. But I, I do, um, this balance between catering to visitors and locals is something I feel like every tourism community struggles with and we definitely do. Um, Early on, even when I was in AmeriCorps, this small business owner, she has a small mot like boutique motel and a kind of bed and breakfast and some other things. So she employs a lot of people. She's like, whatever we're doing as a community here, we need to be thinking about why, like we need to make this the best place that we want to live, the best quality of life for our residents. We want, the businesses we want, activities we want, events we want. And then we welcome in the tourists um, to that. And by doing that, <laughs> which is not easy, by doing that, we make a really authentic like place that tourists will want to come, especially 
you know, kind of a newer phase of tourists that, you know, are staying in town more or like, um, do you want some of these you know, breweries and some of these different types of businesses? But I, it's not easy, but I, I feel like I try to keep that on my mind whenever I'm working with small businesses or working, doing, you know, events in town or we're doing strategic planning or design, like, who is our focus here? And it should be our residents who, you know, they don't, we have really low incomes here still in our main worker population, um, still high, you know, all the, all the indicators that you hear about Appalachia really in our community. Um, so like focusing on that, making it just the most active and vibrant community we can, hopefully then that will translate into people wanting to come, but also respecting the community a little more maybe and also having a more authentic experience that can then maybe turn into you know small business revenue especially and i i am in we're a cdfi so i'm really i hope you i wish you all had a cdfi to work with who could really um community development financial institution who could really support your small business community too because they that feels key to have these authentic small businesses in your town right now anyway I'm excited. Um, yeah, Emily, you kind of took the words out of my mouth for sure. In terms of, I think, I think the anyone who's in a position of power needs to switch their mindset, and it's less about how do we make a quality visitor experience, and instead, how do we increase quality of life, um, and for for the people who live there year round. And so, if there's a ton of taxes that are being generated by these people coming in, um, is there a way to get donations from the cruise ships? Use use that money to create those community centers, to create your CDFI, and you know harness harness the power of these spenders that are coming off of the cruise ships um, and their and their tax dollars. Um, I think the other thing is. Um, helping locals who want who do who want to like start a business or create a product or um, expand what they're already doing to to help make that happen and so one project that i really love is a project that happened in east iceland called designs from nowhere where they took local artisans and local uh, materials they paired that with designers from other places so from like mainland europe and then they made new products uh, that sell for a, quite a bit of money um, using these kind of traditional, um, for them, it was like net making. They were using seaweed, they were using reindeer horn to make jewelry, and, and but there were these high, highly designed items and it's nothing like you can get on the cruise ship. I've been the person on the Alaskan cruise ship, so I can say that. Um, <laughs> And just make things that really resonate with the people that live there and that are you know authentic uh to to the community and then that generates income for them and then it's less about like oh here comes the cruise ship and it's more like here comes the cruise ship we get to share our culture what how how wonderful um and then i think you talked a little bit about sort of like people on the cruise ship not knowing the culture that they're stepping into i think that's an opportunity to create maybe some short videos that could be shown on the cruise ship or when someone buys their ticket on the cruise ship. And I'm talking like really well-produced, beautiful videos. I think specifically for Sitka, I think of the musician um, Ya Tassin. He has some like really beautiful videos. He's a musician based there. And like maybe working with him or some other folks um, to create stuff that's just gonna like pull, pull people in and to really see that culture. Even if once they get into Sitka, they don't necessarily see it because they only go to the jewelry shop. But at least they have the opportunity to experience some of that. Okay, and for now we're going to leave it at that. I know we could keep going with all of these, but um, I want to do a, a quick review of all the conversations that we've had. So let's switch over to screen sharing Miro and remove spotlights for now. And let's just talk about what we're seeing here. So if you recall, from Sarah's conversation, design challenge questions, really thinking about funding for a project. After the plan is developed, how do you continue that and make it sustainable? Are there alternative funding sources? And there are so many ideas that you all had put into place. I'm gonna scroll through just a few of them. Find what we have capacity for put effort into shared housing options, hiking and biking trails perhaps to get people in. 
broadly defining acknowledgement of the arts, having hotel motel taxes. I'll zoom in on some of these smaller ones so you can see them. Farmers markets, concerts, that one came up for a few of the, um, the different towns that we were talking about. And we're still adding to these. So if you don't see yours up, we'll get it up there. And then when we were talking about Project Gain in Hugo, D'Amelia was wondering how to make use of the space that they have with the programming that they, they have and match it and integrate art in a way that also preserves history. And here are some of the ideas that you came up with. Start with small steps was one theme that I heard coming up in a, a few places in the chat and what Emily and Maria were saying. Incorporating youth, don't name things before you've tried them out in smaller scopes first. Help out with dinner night. Think about childcare options. Think about broadband providers and partnerships. Think about schools. All right, and then with Camille's community talking about the Sitka tribe. Oh, I don't see you with me. Tyler, you might have to just move to the next slide. Just to the right. The design questions were about tourism and how to um, make quality of life good for the people who live there as well as um, kind of work with a booming tourist population. Okay, good ideas and insights here. So many things that we're still adding in. Could the cruise companies be potential funders? Help make locals interested in starting a business. Lots of good links to check out here with resources. Indigenous culture is one of your biggest assets. Focus on the community needs first and plan from there. All right, so we have so many good ideas. I wanna ask you all, now that we've kind of had a recap of everything, um, what are the key takeaways or questions or resources that you'd like to share in our remaining time together? So for insights, that's something you wanna try in your community that you learned today. A new idea or tip. I'd love for you to add your thoughts in the chat. For questions, are there any open loops, things that you wanna ask out into the group today? Things that some of our speakers might be able to circle back on? And then resources, please continue to share those links and ideas. There's so many good things that have been coming up and what we're going to do is harvest this so you all have these to share. Finding ways to utilize CDFI organizations in our community, Melinda, awesome. There was a question earlier, Jamie, about um, pros and cons of tourism and specifically, how can a place maintain its local vibrancy and creativity amid such rapid growth? Okay, um, great, yes. That's a good one. It's a lot. I mean, it's a little bit of what we talked about with Camille, but I think like, again, it's that like creating that, creating a place uh, for the people who live there and always like keeping that at the center of anything that you're doing. Yes. Thanks for highlighting that, Maria. Keep them coming in the chat. I know there's a lot of conversation that we've had today, so it's nice to just kind of recap of, here's one takeaway that I'm gonna take with me when I go out into my community. Experiment with a space before you completely commit by Julie. Yeah, awesome. Small steps, right? Okay, I want to quickly pass things over to Stephen and Manda and keep keep your comments coming through the chat. We'll keep adding them in, but I just wanna um, share the space with them so they can let you know what's next. 
Hi, I'm Stephen with the Housing Assistance Council. I'm a, a white man with a, with a white shirt and a Mississippi Delta Blues poster behind me. And one thing I would like to add from the Housing Assistance Council and our partners is that we promise a robust follow-up. We're saving this. Manda on our team has done a great job compiling all of this. We'll combine this with resources we've learned over the last five or six years at our organization doing rural design and placemaking. And we do promise follow-up with all the participants. And we've even left a few dollars in the budget so we can have a robust and meaningful follow-up. So thank you all for doing that. And thank you to our funders for ensuring that's possible. With that, back to you, Jamie. Okay, awesome. All right, well, we are arriving at the end of our time. So for those questions and insights and resources that are coming in, we're gonna keep adding them. But before we go, I want to just offer and invite all of you to share some love to all of our speakers today with some applause, emoji reactions um, in the chat. Just let them know how much you enjoyed uh, today's call. And on, at the same time, thanks to all of you for the insights that you offered. We are better together as a collective rural community. So thank you for joining the call today. And with that, we'll say good day to you and hope to see you in the future. Take care, everybody.